I'm Mike Tan. I'm a woodworker, but I haven't made my own stool yet. Wait, so what are we doing? This is the intro. Are right. we now we're already doing it? Now we're doing it. Yeah, so what are we doing? <laughs> well, the, the, what are we doing? The glowing... Oh, sorry. Uh, this is... Indie, Indie Not, not films. films. Are you listening to that, Sam? Sam, what are we listening to? I asked you, but it's haven't the, made it I yet. Mean, I mean, <laughs> the glowing flamingos on, which means... <laughs> it's showtime. It's showtime. It's showtime. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're, uh, we're, we're, we're talking to a, a phenomenal guest. I, uh, every guest is phenomenal, but this one... Is reporting from a part of the world that has a monsoon season <laughs> it's currently yeah pouring uh, he this is mike tan uh it's uh he lives in the philippines currently pouring down rain and uh he's using his phone for which recording. is a nokia <laughs> from 2003 <laughs> and uh it, it's it hasn't broken since no nope. wait are you guys joking no, <laughs> I mean yes. Oh. It's a Motorola razor. He's, he's right. using it's an a, LG chocolate. A Huawei. I, yeah, that's his phone. One of the Chinese phones. Oh, okay. Huawei. Oh. It's a good phone, actually. They 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 make good mm-hmm. phones. They make oh, pretty yeah, good phones. Has an opinion. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, we all have iPhones. <laughs> iPhones, the way to go. Oh God. Awesome, and uh, we have we have a little icebreaker for you, Mike. Oh wait, which one are we doing? Are we doing <laughs> best. Well, we were trying to. Th- we're thinking islands. We're thinking. Obviously, your home is you know very um, a, a tourist location for for some people. So we're thinking. Yeah, uh, it's a coastal area. Yeah, coastal area, islands, um, vacation vibe. Where the warm up question is going to be everyone's favorite vacation spot. Sam, do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sure. First, a favorite like vacation spot. I think probably this past summer I went to Korea with my family. So I guess that's an island as well. Yeah. There you go. Island. I guess it has to be an island. <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, it doesn't have to be an island, but uh, this one is. And I think just I'm half Korean and I've never been to Asia before this trip. So I think that was kind of like a big, almost like a, a personal fulfillment kind of situation Wait a and korea's a peninsula isn't it it's, yeah it is an island it, no oh. yeah Wait, it's oh, not <laughs> okay I mean, well, it's a huge island what's, a, what's it's the a defini- continental island uh, a part of china and russia and the conglomerate of all the other continents sure but it's an island <laughs> isn't it <laughs> no how no. is it not an island it's it it it, it, it well, i think it. some parts of it are <laughs> there, there are parts of Korea that are an island. Mike's right. Okay, so let's just, just for for everyone's <laughs> record here, I we're both right. <laughs> we're both All right, right. but anyways, <laughs> yeah, it was great. Uh, the food is amazing. The environment, like we went to Seoul because that's where the majority of my family was, and I haven't met a lot of my family members with the same last name as me because my dad's the Korean uh, in my family, and um, so that was really nice in a lot of ways. So favorite and memorable and meaningful. There you go. Yeah. Yannick? My favorite island slash vacation spot would have to be uh, Malta, which is a a Spanish island in the Mediterranean. I went there as a kid and the whole island is one big medieval fortress. And I loved medieval stuff as a kid. And it was so cool to see the history there. And um, they got like cannons there that are like, the size of cars and like all the everything a medieval uh a boy that likes medieval stuff it would be into so it was that one i was very fascinated by that island i i i guess going with island vibe i i don't know i and well i i guess i'd say hawaii my sister used to live in north shore hawaii and that was just awesome just to like go to her house and have a good time and you know, just forget about the world for a little bit. But Mike, uh, favorite vacation spot? Uh, where would where would you go? Uh, an island. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're we're on the island. Or peninsula. Or peninsula. Apparently. <laughs> right. okay. So uh, there's one I've been to, and I got to be there not on vacation, but actually in work. But 
you know, my, you know, our work is like vacation too. So there's one spot in the Philippines called Lubang Island. Mm. Uh, it's uninhabited, no buildings there, wow. no electricity. And, uh, like when we stayed there for a month and we had to build our own camp and stuff and there were no roads going in. So everything came in by boat and no communication to except for a satellite phone for, you know, emergency. So it was like the, the bare basics, you know, like you had to survive to stay there, but it was really fun. There was no other people around except for us. And it was also historical because, uh, during the Japanese war, they sent one soldier to go there, uh, to stay there with, uh, spe- uh, like, uh, confidential documents. And he was ordered not to leave that island and only leave when the general says so. So the thing is, the war ended, the general died, never got the order to leave. He stayed there for 30 years. Oh, my gosh. Wow. I, Yannick was actually telling me about this. Yeah. It's true. Uh, it's, uh, it, it happened in, uh, not, not actually in Lubang, in Gunting Island. It's a small island in the Philippines about this Japanese soldier who, like, lived in that island for 30 years. And, like, uh, when the war was over, people actually from Japan, people from Japan actually went there to, like, take him home. But... He didn't want to. He was still waiting orders from his general. Like, uh, until one day, like, he, uh, somebody finally convinced him to, like, to go home. And, yeah, they took him out. But, like, he was uh, a bit f- uh, feral. He didn't want to socialize with people and stuff. And, you know, like, he didn't trust anyone. It's a nice place. We actually saw the, all the spots he stayed at. Even the small uh small like river banks he made on his own to like divert water to his place we all saw that it was a great place and did you and i would like to go back to the, did you refuse to leave me yeah <laughs> uh we had to because like our, our permit ended oh okay our permit ended. <laughs> so not, not as stubborn <laughs> what are we gonna do our uh, permit ended <laughs> <laughs> But it was a great place, and you can go back there. Uh, you just need to uh, get permission from the local government, and they'll allow you to go back. I was going to plug Werner Herzog's book, which is the newest book, which is about this. It's very entertaining. And the way they actually got him off was they got a general from Japan to come down and do it. And he would only answer to a general because all these like journalists yeah. and people yeah. tried, and they got the general to, to come pull him out. Very interesting, very Werner Hortz, Herzog-y, weird storytelling techniques. But anyway, we're done with the islands, we're done with the intro, <laughs> and we're going to get into it. Making it for me is not worrying to reach into my pocket to see if I still have some money left. You don't want the stress of of knowing if you have money or not, if you'll be all right or not. Financial freedom. Like not, not worrying if I have enough for the day. Yeah. That's uh, I mean, that's valuable to, to think about. It's, it's, it's something that, I mean, I can definitely relate to of, um, like sometimes you, you're doing this job day by day. Um, and you don't really know what's going to happen in the next couple weeks. Yeah, for me, making it is like, you know, uh, for example, today, I don't have to reach in my pocket to check if I have enough until tomorrow. You know? And that's for today. Then tomorrow, I'm going to think the same thing. I don't have to reach in my pocket today to make sure I have enough for tomorrow. Yeah. You know? For me, like, that that's made. You know, like, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. Like, you always have something extra. Yeah. To go the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Yeah, and your your philosophy on life seems to be so, uh, to be present and kind of take things as they come. And so I can see that having that stability, you know, sometimes isn't isn't part of that. So 
yeah, it's a double-edged sword. You have this like great freedom and everything, and, and you're able to be present and have these new experiences and take whatever job. But you know, there, there's a, that that lifestyle comes with a certain certain stress. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's why you have to actually be there to, you know, live it. And because if you don't, you, you won't know where to think about it. Yeah, you don't know. You, you won't know how to deal with stuff. Mike, uh, you you do a lot of art department stuff. What what would you kind of call your position? Basically, I'm I'm an art director, but uh, I'm not like those other directors who just like manages a team of artists of uh, set men. I'm I'm more into like hands on. I want to be, you know, I want to be part of the work being done. Totally. But usually they call me an art director. Aside from my work in film and production as an art director, uh, I also own a shop, a woodworking shop. Um, basically, when I'm not when I'm not filming, I do woodwork because that is the, uh, like it's one of my passions. I met Mike in a past gig that I did, and he had so many just like snippets of phenomenal stories that like he would just. He would just like walk by and just tell like this this gem of a story, and be like, "What have you not done?" kind of thing. And I I would love to hear my my favorite story that you you told me is um how you got into filmmaking. If you if you would love to tell our listeners that. Uh yeah sure. Uh, there's actually a story that comes before that. Oh my god! How I Should I get more to the story. Yeah yeah yeah. Uh, uh, more than a decade ago, I actually became an accidental surfer. <laughs> I, I had no plans to surf, actually. Like, <laughs> So I lived nearby this uh, surf spot, and I had nothing to do one day and just went there and, you know, just wanted to have a beer. Never left. Stayed there for eight years. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I hate it when that happens. So I was a woodworker, so I helped them like build this hut right in front of the beach. Actually, they watched and I built. <laughs> uh, I and that was our like uh, uh, our home for yeah more than eight years until it until the hotel came up and wanted it to be removed from its view. But during that time, while I was staying there surfing and all that stuff, partying all night. Um, a production team came into my area and so they were doing an episode of the race before, the amazing race, and so they were looking for a, a carpenter. Like um, They had some props made and they were running out of time. So they asked the locals there, uh, like they were looking for a carpenter and yeah, we know one and the locals came up to me. Uh, they said, uh, "Hey, you, uh, somebody's looking up for a carpenter. You uh, you want to do it?" I said, yeah, sure. So said that. Then I didn't actually go to the meeting. I just said, "Yeah," because I thought they were going to me. So I was just there in my hammock, hanging out at the beach. Then I actually forgot the meeting I had with them after a beer or so. <laughs> you, you you stayed <laughs> yeah. in your hammock. <laughs> Yeah, I stayed in the hammock, and and then my friends came again the next day. Uh, hey, they they wanted you to uh, like have a meeting, and I said okay, and so I just came from surfing that day. So I didn't know that it was a meeting with uh, the creative art director and all the location managers, and it was inside this like conference room inside the hotel. So. I went in because I didn't have any clothes with me. I came in like uh, without a shirt on, just board shorts, my feet still with sand. And uh, came in and said, hey, are you Mike? Yeah, I'm Mike. Then, yeah, uh, they showed me this prop. Like it, it was made of wood plywood and it looked like a giant matchstick. And they asked me, hey, we need 150 of these. Uh, can you make it? And yeah, sure. When do you need it? And they said, two days. Yeah, sure. So I did that with the help of the locals, of course. 
So we did that in two days, finished it, then got paid. Then after that, they actually called me again for another meeting. And I was thinking, hey, I, I, shit, I think we fucked up something because they're calling me up. <laughs> then oh, I came to the go. meeting. <laughs> I uh, came to the meeting, then they actually told me, that, hey, can you do one more thing for us? And I said, yeah, sure. So I did another episode for them. Then uh, when that was done, so it was back to normal life again. We were just hanging out at the beach. And so they wrapped the episode at my area. And just before they left, they called me up again for another meeting. And they told me, hey, what are you doing? You know, we're doing another episode, but... It's far from here and we have to fly there. Are you available for doing it? I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I started with that. It took me to one episode. We had to fly in there and stayed there for a week. Then after the episode, I was already packing up my stuff, uh, ready to go home. Then they told me, uh, hey, where are you going? I'm going home. I'm done. No, no, no. They want you to do another episode. So it, that's how it all started. Like they took me in, and that's how I got started into film production. Yeah, and you kind of you traveled with them. Yeah, and uh, oh no, before we only traveled locally, yeah, domestically in the Philippines. So every time they had an episode or like, not even just their show, they even recommended me to other shows, like um. I do stuff for uh, like networks and stuff, like documentaries and stuff. And I also do reality TV shows. And I even started starring some before. Like there's this one show about this guy who makes, I think he's really famous. He's Canadian. So he does this like uh, tiny house things, like living small things. So I got a, I got a chance to work with that guy too. And ever since then, whenever foreign companies, even other um, production outfits that do a lot of different TV shows, every 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 time they have like uh, something to do or something to film in the Philippines, uh, most of them call me up and check if I'm available. And that's how I got into the business. I I think it's it's cool that, that like when in your first gig when you had to do a hundred and fifty something uh, things, uh, you pretty much were like, yeah, I can do it, and then you went straight to your uh, crew, which was just the, your surfer buds, and you yeah, yeah. you you gave them all the 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 I, I think you you said the the production company supplied all the tools and stuff, so you just handed these guys yeah. all these tools. And yeah, yeah, and you all just got it done. <laughs> it's just yeah, 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 phenomenal. And, and we didn't know yeah. how it, how it went, so we just built it. We didn't know that okay, we we had to bring it here and stuff. All we all we knew that was like because it was our first time doing props and stuff, so we didn't even know that we had to set it up. <laughs> oh, but uh, well, luckily, like uh, when they told us hey, you needed to bring it here and. Arrange it like this, and uh, yeah, sure. So we hired a truck, got it there, and had it done way before they needed it. Yeah. How how consistently, um, ever since you started, have companies been coming through and, and hiring you? I, you know, I, I can't imagine there's that many travel shows to keep you busy all the time, but I could be wrong. Uh, no, uh, in a year's time, I probably do about six or seven shows. Okay, that's quite a bit. Different ones, yeah. Sometimes documentaries, sometimes narrative series. And you've worked with companies such as like National Geographics and um, and BBC, um, like big big Discovery. documentaries. Yeah, Discovery. Yeah, uh, AXN. But the ones that uh, often get me are, aside from the reality shows, the ones that often get me are from National Geographic and um, Discovery Channel. Yeah. Explain how it is working in the art department through these uh is it kind of travel documentaries you would say you would do or what, what's your kind of genre that you tend to work in um uh for uh national geographic it's mostly so 
they have this uh like uh shows that they produce like for example uh legends of the wild it's a tv show uh mm. that's being produced by national geographic and so these guys talk about like um invasive wildlife so basically we travel to a place where um you know there's like uh probably a big snake invading a farm or an infestation of crocodiles going to a village something like that that's for national geographic but for discovery channel it's more of a different genre sometimes we do uh series about cults and stuff and about superstitious beliefs so that's pretty interesting with uh, discovery channel because the research takes a long while and you know it gets scary sometimes especially if like people don't want to talk and somebody talked and like uh, all the other people who didn't want to talk get angry and so uh it's scary sometimes like uh you become the documentary reporter yourself and with regards to work basically i just do the set we copy something like for example we do a show uh we did a show before for our discovery channel the thing actually happened in papua new guinea okay mm, okay but it was too expensive to bring the whole crew to Papua New Guinea. But luckily, there's a minority race in the Philippines called the Aitas. Mm -hmm. So the Papua New Guineans and this local Aitas, they look and they dress alike. Even their houses look similar. Even the villages look similar. So they decided to do it here in the Philippines where there are less restrictions and stuff. But the thing is, though, the problem was the Papua New Guineans were a bit taller. These local idas were about four feet less than five foot tall. But we managed to do it by, of course, we made a set with smaller houses because the people were shorter mm. to make them look bigger. Mm. So we copied the set. Uh, they had a photo peg and we just built a new village making the houses smaller so the people would actually look bigger so are sets so i know you mentioned a few things that you've made on these shows are is that always changing like is every different show we're asking you to do different kinds of builds or are they all pretty similar like are you always making like things that are structural like these houses or uh, is it just anything no uh sometimes we it doesn't just it, it isn't just structural Sometimes it even involves costumes. Oh. And sometimes it even involves uh, general scenery. Like we have to actually select a spot that matches the, um, how do you say, that matches the theme in their, what they want to do. Yeah. So it involves research too, not only build. Yeah. And that's why sometimes when it's only for a two day shoot, or maybe a one day shoot, the prep and scout actually takes a long, long while. Maybe sometimes like a month or sometimes even more just to get all the details right. And I've, you, you were telling me sometimes you were also almost doing like animal wrangling work to, yeah, which, yeah. which I found funny as someone in the art department needing to kind of like, push a tree so a snake would move a certain uh, way yeah uh like we had to like make the snake go up into a fence and trigger the alarm we actually had to like do it a couple of times because the snake kept going back to its owner <laughs> mm. so you know that series um lost gold i don't have you seen that no 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 the ones who uh the, the same guys who did uh uh oak island the curse of oak island Ooh, i have seen that one yeah they're the ones who did the same uh the same thing they're the ones who were doing the series lost gold mm -hmm. all of that all of that's fake man. 
Basically, <laughs> the TV show there, the TV show they're doing is a front for actual treasure hunting. They they are actually looking for a treasure, so they can easily get permits to dig it. Oh, stuff. so oh, they mimic wow. it. Yeah, because they get easier permits by saying, "Oh no, we're just gonna shoot," instead of uh, like, "Oh no, we're gonna look for treasure." Well, oh, this, that's so exciting! Wow, all very interesting. Those, uh, <laughs> those producers and even the cast—they're really not in film. They're really treasure hunters. Mm. So they're all just gonna share the treasure if they find it. I think that's how they got rich. <laughs> Mike, can you get me onto this one of these shows, <laughs> these treasure hunting shows? Uh, uh, actually, we were supposed to do one here before, but it was during the pandemic and it got held down. And the thing is, this uh, so the equipment is still here. It's in Shargao. It's still here. Let's do it. Oh, we have yeah. a Let's make, our, yeah. Yeah. Let's make our own. <laughs> the reason why they're not continuing it right now. So they started, so it was pandemic, right? No one was allowed to go out and stuff. No one was allowed to travel. So to keep the show alive, these guys started uh, like um, a Facebook group, like a, uh, a Facebook page. And I think some of the guys leaked or said too much information regarding the show and what they're going to do that they actually told the whole story of what they're going to do here in the Philippines before they even get the chance to do it. Oh, cool. So we have a script and everything. <laughs> yeah. We so, can completely uh, take like, their story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so basically, you already know what's going to happen because they've already mentioned it in the page where they're going to look, where there is. So people already know where it is. So it got boring. No one was already following it. And they just canceled it. But I think they're gonna do. They're still gonna do digging, right? Because oh, have, they not? their equipment is still here. Yeah, and we're still, we're still on standby anytime they come back. I want. I'll, I'm gonna come back with them. <laughs> oh, that's a long commitment. <laughs> I got a metal detector. I'm ready. Yeah, he's gonna gonna oh, catch they, it. They have first. big ones. <laughs> yeah, they have big ones. They oh. have like high tech equipment. I'm surprised nobody's sneakily done some digging already. Because if the locations are public, if they spill those no, beans. No, uh, before they left, they actually, uh, so we already started digging before. And before they left, uh, during their last scout, they actually had uh, the digging uh, filled up with soil. And they actually bought the property oh. uh, using, a, using a Filipino's name. Hmm. What is this treasure? I'm getting really hung up on the treasure <laughs> story, but I really want to know. Uh, the myth of Yamashita. Oh, that sounds so good. <laughs> that sounds yeah, so the general cool. who hid. We're, we're heading there tomorrow. The general hid, hid some treasure there? Some war loot? A lot. Wow. A lot, but it's not like the one they're saying, like, uh, like lots and lots of it. Yes. It's scattered all over the Philippines. Okay. And it's basically, it's not the general who actually hit it. So the general had his loot, right? And whenever the general was away, these soldiers got some of their own from the loot and hid it by themselves mm. in different areas. So the soldiers were actually stealing from General Yamashita. And then, so whatever okay. was left, when Yamashita was, or was arrested, was taken by the government. And whatever was lost from Yamashita and hidden by the soldiers is still to be found. Mike, um, you seem very resourceful and like there's no limit to what you're willing to say yes to. Has there ever been a project or a request where you've been like, I can't do this? Um, you mean I can't say? like No, like I you can't. can't you, stuff? you said it's not where you didn't feel like it was possible what they asked because of the time limit or the resources required. Has, you, has that ever happened to you or have you always figured out how to make it work? Uh, we've always figured it out, but it's not like, uh, it's more on using alternatives. Okay. Yeah. Getting to the closest of, uh, possible. Because sometimes requests are really impossible, especially depends on where the location is. 
So when something is requested and uh, there's not much time, we figure out the closest thing possible that's relevant to whatever they want. Okay. So it seems like you've made a lot of stuff. What would you say is like the one that you're most proud of or like your favorite one that you've been asked to build? I can't remember. There's too much of it. <laughs> uh, the one where we had to make a whole village. Is that the one where you you also played as an extra? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, the one where I played extra was uh, on Legends of the Wild where I played a farmer who like complained about a big snake <laughs> they literally <laughs> they, i guess uh, what did you say they didn't like like the look of the actual extra and they they needed to find someone quick and they're like hey that's the one we like we like your look and he and mike's like just the art director being like me <laughs> who's gonna build all yeah, the... <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah that's the one uh, where uh they actually hired a, uh, an actor but this actor like was very very difficult to deal with, mm. and but I've done a lot. I I can't actually remember, but uh, I think what I what I'm really proud of, like to actually be part of it. You know, like yeah, yeah, not only like uh, telling a team what to do, like most, not most, all all of the all of the sets, uh, the props, and the films and stuff that I did. I was there, right there, building. I yeah. wasn't behind this. I wasn't. I wasn't like in an office, like handing out orders or calling someone to do this and that. Like I was right there, building and stuff. That's why I appreciate when when I was working with you. Of um, we we had an interesting kind of dynamic duo playing, where um, a lot of us in in the position that we're in um, would be kind of doing office work we could we could have easily had the same position and be doing office work to kind of even have to work you don't even have to be there actually yeah i really appreciated like your ability to to want to be where the action is happening and it, it honestly made things flow a lot easier because you knew how everybody all the workers were feeling right now you knew how the project was going because you were in the project at that moment and that, that's that's exactly the same energy yeah. that i wanted yeah. um where do you think that that came from where um that that sense of needing to be like uh, you're, you're still leading you're still kind of um taking yeah, charge yeah. and giving orders but being still in that place uh why why do you think that is uh it's uh for me like it's a sense of completion you know like to have something in my mind and actually be part of making it materialize up till the end and not only like just having this idea float around and blow it to someone else and then when that happens and like you know uh they build it it was my idea uh it came from my imagination and someone else builds it for me like you know um i don't feel like i'm really part of it for me like i want to actually have my ideas become tangible with my help and not only like my thoughts mm. you know i want to be there to actually hold it and like hammer it down, put it together and not only like imagine how it's going to look because thinking of it, you already know how it's going to look, but actually being there to build it. Yeah. That's, that's different. No, that's completion. That's fulfillment. Yeah. That's beautiful. Like to see your thoughts materialize for me, that's important. That makes me wonder what you did before that fateful beer at that beach that got you uh, uh, got you situated there um like did you i'm assuming you you already had a background in in woodworking at least uh my family uh, my mom and dad uh they actually owned uh, a furniture shop that was passed on to my brothers but it wasn't passed on to me 
because before they wanted me to uh, to go to college and be a doctor. Uh, so I did that. I got not be a doctor. I graduated pre med and took one year of medicine, but lost interest somewhere in the middle because like it's too much uh, too much time inside the classroom, and uh, you know it got boring. So I came back to came back home. Uh, was helping with the shop. And it was from then that I, like, really knew that I wanted to be in woodwork. So with your own shop, do you mostly, like, work with the furniture shop still? Or is there other, or is it film-focused? Or or is there other Uh, commissions, I suppose? uh, Commissions and also uh, I supply stuff. Like, for example, now I'm... Um, I've decided to suddenly put up a small farm. So now I'm taking care of chickens. I'm taking care of birds for the first time. Wow. So, so yeah, I actually have uh, about more than 40 chickens now, different breeds and stuff, and about a couple of birds. So what I'm doing is I'm, like right now, I'm making bird houses and bird feeders out of wood. Then I let my pets test it out. And these these aren't just your typical birdhouse. Uh, no, these are like uh, there's like modified version, and they're more decorative. They're really cool. Like, you should put them yeah, on our Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll do that. That's uh, because I mean, you have like like a a beehive esque birdhouse, and then you have yeah, like yeah, a yeah. pagoda birdhouse. Like you have so many different that designs. Actually, the honeycomb thing that actually inspired me. Be like. Uh, one of my friends last week was talking about, hey, how do you explain sex to a kid? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a hot take. <laughs> uh, I remember the story about the birds and the bees. Uh, so that inspired me oh, to make those. birds and the bees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, inspired me to do that uh, honeycomb-shaped uh, bird housing. That's funny. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> So now I uh, like uh, I'm doing this farm stuff. Like uh, I'm making something, making a birdhouse or making a feeder, and I'm making my pets test it out. And if it's good, I sell it in the market. I post it, and I get orders from pet shops, from farms, and stuff like that. And I can guarantee that now that thing's tested. I tested it out on live animals, so that thing works. Something like that. Wow. What made you want to do birds of all animals? Oh, uh, because my house is like up on a big hill, even my shop. So every morning, like I wake up to wild chickens and the sounds of wild birds. Uh, And even before when I put up my shop, before even putting up my shop, the first thing I put there in the land was like bird houses. So I put up there houses first before I put up mine. Oh, that's so nice. It's like full yeah. circle. Besides the one I'm selling, uh, I also want to plan to make special ones or the intricate ones. But these ones I'm not going to sell. Like, uh, for example, I go to a certain place uh, to relax or something. Maybe go there for a beer and I would bring one of my bird houses and hang it there for the birds. And I would post this on Facebook, unknown location, take a photo, and maybe a caption that says, if you see this, please do not take it. This is not your home. It's theirs. Something like that. You know, whenever I have time, I would make one and would hang it randomly somewhere. That's so sweet. But I haven't started, though. Like, uh, I'm still making them and probably going to start mid-month of August. One second. <laughs> Stand by. There's just gunshots outside. Oh, I think hey. we're I think we're good. I right? think we're good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're okay. <laughs> this, this is the environment we live in. <laughs> well, so let's reading? talk about birdhouses. <laughs> we yeah. just yeah. That sounds lovely. Just like you're just leaving behind birdhouses, so they just have a nice little place to stay. Yeah. Did you build yeah, your yeah. Did you build your own house as well? Well, uh, my shop, I did. 
uh, my house I decide, but uh, I had it built by workers, but the design was mine. And but my shop, I put up my shop from, so my shop came from this, uh, not, it's not a bare land, it's like a forest land. So there were a lot of trees there and stuff, but I had to clear it out. But once, once it cleared out, all the wood was that came from there. I also used in and building my shop from the posts to the beams, to the walls, it all came back in. Is this all self-taught also? Like all these skills that you've... Well, from the, the furniture shop. But is that... Yeah, yes, but like did the, someone uh, teach you or did that just... How did you learn? I think it's like whenever I build something that I'm done with it, I always have this nagging thought that I can make this better. And like, like uh, I can improve this. Until I get to the point that, okay, this is good. This is like all I can do to it to improve it mm. until I get to that point. So I learn about it, you know, like uh, the constant kind of trial and error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it sounds self taught, though. That's so impressive. So basically, when I make something, I make a prototype first, like just one piece, like with. And, thing, and this thing gets modified and modified until I get the final version that I want to produce. Then I just use that as basis for measurements and stuff. A prototype takes me about maybe a week to make. But as soon as I get it done, I dismantle it and measure the pieces and I mass produce it. Do you, Mike... Uh there could have been a timeline in your life that you weren't, you wouldn't be in film. You would be doing, I mean, you'd still be creating, you'd be doing art and carpentry, but um, do you enjoy this process of being in, in film in the different aspects that you do? Or are you like, are you okay with the idea that it, it, if it didn't happen, your life would have been good as well. Mm. Yeah, I'm like you did. I'm good with it because I still get to do what I love. That's what's important. Yeah. I get to travel, but it pays well. So, and it's not all the time. That's what I like about it. Yeah, totally. Like, like everyday work that I have to go to. And you can control it too. Yeah. And like, at first I hated the, the pressure, the timeline, especially like, uh, okay, you only have two days to do this. But and I got used to it. And you know, like, it's already given and I kind of, I kind of miss it actually. Yeah. I know that feeling missing, missing the intensity and the adrenaline of like a tight, deadline film work I mean, you feel accomplished after mm -hmm. uh, but before uh, so let's say when the race met me before here in my area and they were looking for a carpenter so let's say that scenario right yeah mm -hmm. i'm here in my town years before and someone from manila would ask me to go do an episode there and not actually meeting meeting me that's like hey can you go to manila now and do this for us you know what i would have just stayed at the beach and got another beer wouldn't have left hmm. i think that the only thing that made me do that first one before because they were there and i didn't have to leave the beach <laughs> and i mean yeah and he just kind of walked into this path that ended up working out <laughs> sounds yeah. like and like so the reason i stayed longer was that they were making me do something i like you know for me it wasn't a job for me it was like spending time and it paid well so yeah. when they asked me to do an episode somewhere else and i said hey that's not work that's vacation for free <laughs> and you pay me <laughs> for free and you pay me <laughs> Yeah, and and I get paid, so it's, yeah. Hey, don't and give then, don't give it away, Mike. 
<laughs> we don't want other people to know about this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been saying yes ever since, whenever production work comes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mike, could, can you see yourself doing this kind of work for the rest of your life, or do you ever feel like you'll get bored of it? Or want, want something a little bit more relaxing, maybe that isn't as stressful with the deadlines and everything? Uh, I think I would still be doing this for a long, long, long time. But in the end, like, uh, I want to be like, um, how do you say, Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Talk to the right crowd. <laughs> Uh, just stop wor uh, like stop worrying about stuff and you know just live the rest of my life out the way I want it to but the ring is so tempting <laughs> the ring is film work oh, yeah the ring is film work <laughs> it's a call action. it always comes it always <laughs> brings you back corrupts into the you. <laughs> corrupts you that was Stockholm I think by so that true. time in that future <laughs> when I've done all the shows that I can I am able to do I think I can manage to buy my own ring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you uh, can, we all aspire I'll get another to. Ring. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> I don't need that one. <laughs> That's cool. What do you uh what do you see yourself where do you see yourself going in the next five, ten years? Where do you where do you wanna be? Uh, so uh I was actually offered work uh maybe a couple of weeks back. Someone offered me work in in Australia, so it was like uh, this furniture making company. Uh, when they uh, when they called me up, uh, I answered because like uh, I was recommended. So I answered and I talked to them. Then I found out that it was a contract. It was gonna take long, and also I wasn't gonna do actual work. They just wanted me to supervise, and. I said no. What I want to do, or what I in the next five to ten years, I think with the way things are going, because we have this tie up now with Creative TV, and I think there just is gonna be more overseas work from now on. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a place you're hoping to go to? I mean, Australia maybe, or is there a specific spot that you you would love to work in? Uh, anywhere as long as I don't have to stay there too long. Okay. Because I love my home. You got the chickens. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I always want to, like, wherever I may go, I, I always want to go back here after. You know? mm. Yeah. I guess I'm going to miss my shop. I'm going to miss my family. I'm going to miss my, you know, my pets. Like, I'm growing a farm now, so I'm going to miss doing this. Because uh, after everything or anything that happens to me in the next 5, 10, or 20 years, whatever happens to me, after all that, I want to be back here, home, and nowhere else. Yeah. That's nice that you have a, a place um, that that you you feel a sense of home that it's it's good to go out and see the world but it's nice that you do have this place that you can come back to and you know that this is this is yours this is where you want to be wherever you end up in the next 10 years hopefully it'll be somewhere abroad um and that lets you visit your home as often as you want um we will send you this podcast so you can you can reflect on on your thoughts ten years ago, and with that in mind, do you have a, a message you'd like to record for yourself in the future? Maybe I would say to myself, "You're not there yet." <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it's like a like challenge. It. It's yeah. like <laughs> no, I like the idea that your future self is gonna is asking the question are we there yet <laughs> you're like you're the dad no. in the front seat being like no you're not there yet <laughs> only ways forward like, uh, i mean like uh, it's it's gonna be my motivation you know like to not stop like to just live you know like i don't i i don't like uh i don't go by like uh motivational stuff like that like uh 
uh, for example, uh, good things come to those who wait. You know, stuff like I, I, I don't live by that. Like, if it's a good thing, I'll get it. It's good. <laughs> what, uh, I'm what, not what waiting for it. <laughs> yeah? Like, uh, for me, like, um, life is as if you know. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes um, you don't know what happens tomorrow, but you definitely have to be there tomorrow to find out what happens. Whatever happens, come what may. But it doesn't mean that it's gonna stop there. Well, Mike, you're you're a beautiful soul, and I do want to do uh, plug a thing that you help out in the Philippines. It's called Yellow Boat Project, correct? Yeah, yeah, Yellow Boat, uh, Yellow Boat Foundation. Yellow Boat Foundation. Yeah. Uh, it helps out uh, underprivileged kids who have like uh, travel uh, trouble going to school and stuff. So uh, we build boats for them. We travel there, and besides the boats, we also uh, repair their schools after storms. So I do this once in a while, not often, only when I have the chance, because when we go there, it usually takes a lot of time. And yeah, it's a nice, um, uh, people can help through it, uh, not even volunteering, uh, volunteering stuff. They can, like, some people are just, like, giving uh, school supplies, some people like giving raincoats, you know, it doesn't have to be monetary, just anything to help. Yeah, but talking about like, um, motivational speaking, um, and stuff you don't believe some something that I truly value about you is the fact and you talk about it in your work of action speaks louder than words is like that. That's how you yeah. that's how you work. I see like you're always in the front lines, whatever you're doing and your your actions reflect who you are. And it's cool that you're the person making boats so kids can go to school. You're the person that are is making um making bird houses so these birds have a home it's this it's it's it speaks yeah. it resonates a lot more be, and it, it's something that you love doing and you love creating and it it creates a purpose for um things and people that need it you know, so i i always like if there's something you can do about it something you can help with and like building boats is something i'm good at so like you know uh, for me like no one deserves to live like that. No? So if there's any way I can help, I'll help. No one deserves to be like, they can't get, go to school because the water is too hot because it's flooded. There's a way. You know? People just need to like, because they don't know how, but some people do. Yeah. And that's why we help. Using our powers for good. And you got some good powers going for you. Yeah. Well, I, I thank you so much, Mike, for, for being on. It, this was a lot of interesting stuff. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for being on. And if there's ever an opening on that treasure yeah. hunting crew, <laughs> um, all three of us know. will be there. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> we will go. <laughs> uh, Yannick, I actually, I'm actually still waiting because they haven't paid me yet. Oh. oh, you don't have to. Oh, we'll, well, we'll they haven't find found the money. money yet. They yeah, haven't found we'll, the payment. We'll help you find the money. Yeah, there you go. Thank you so much for <laughs> joining us. Yeah, thank you too, guys, for inviting. Yeah. Oh, so fun. we're we're on this uh, in in our podcast. We have a little outro that we um we we talk into the abyss uh, and. Uh, we're, we're just trying to see what, what abyss are we going to talk into today? I guess, um, did you see Barbie? (laughs) (laughs) What's your take on Barbie? (laughs) Um, so before, uh, when I was a kid, I had a crush on this girl. (laughs) I love this. I had a Barbie, right? Yeah. So, in order for her to play with me, I actually told her that, hey, I can build you a dollhouse. For oh, that my house. God. Oh. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> That's a flex. So, I would be like, absolutely. <laughs> Did you do it? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Like, wow. That's actually how we got to it. Oh. So, so, you love the Barbie movie? Uh-huh.
haven't seen it yet. Man. But yeah, I mean, he made it. He made it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.